I'm David Wessels, most of you know from the Hutchins Center on Fiscal and Monetary Policy here at Brookings. And the point of this lunch, which we've done after each BPA, is to provide an opportunity for reporters to learn something in a relatively informal session. This is on the record. Um, uh, and But what we want to do is uh, keep it embargoed until 15 minutes after it's over, if, if there is any news. The uh, and we are filming this, but the film will not be, uh, it's obviously not live streamed. Um, the idea here is to take advantage of the fact that BPA brings to Brookings some extraordinary economists from all over the world. And it seemed to me it was a missed opportunity in the past not to give reporters a chance to learn something and to ask questions that you may be embarrassed to ask if you're at a, a Fed press conference or certainly in, in the room with all the textbook writers from BPA. So this time is a little different. Instead of picking one paper to discuss, it seemed to me since there are so many interesting questions about where we are in monetary policy today around the world, that it would be interesting just to ask that question. Uh, what are the big questions facing central bankers today and in the near future uh, that reporters, most of whom here work for uh, organizations that are either general news or are aimed at the financial community that they should be thinking about and understanding. And to do that, um, I, we invited Janet Yellen, of course, who's here at Brookings, as you know, the former Fed chair, uh, Lucretia Reichlin, who was the, was it the research director at the ECB? Was once the research director at the ECB and is now at the London Business School, right? Good. Um, and uh, Raghu Rajan, who uh, is at the University of Chicago, but uh, in the past has been chief economist at the IMF and the governor of the Reserve Bank of India. And so what I thought I'd do is ask each of them just to speak for a few minutes about if, if you, you have the opportunity here to help set the agenda of uh, newspapers and wire services uh, who are thinking about monetary policy, what are one or two things in the current conjuncture you think they should be addressing, and then we'll just go right to questions. Do you, do you want to start, Jan? Sure. David, did you mean long-run issues or also short-run issues? Your choice. Well, let me point to um, short-run issue and without going into a lot of detail and a couple of longer-run issues. Short-run issue, um, I think um, Chair Powell made clear, I agree with his assessment he gave at Jackson Hole, U.S. economy is doing extremely well, is as close to meeting its congressional mandates uh, as it's ever been um, at, at or beyond full employment and um, inflation running around 2 percent, which is a wonderful state of affairs. And the question for the Fed is how to manage monetary policy um, to try to keep the expansion going for a long time. And it's going to be quite challenging. And as he put it, um, while there's no sign of overheating now, there are reasons to believe that even now the economy is um, drifted beyond uh, full employment. Um, it has a substantial fiscal stimulus that's uh, an important tailwind at the moment. Um, is it possible uh, that they talk about moving it, moving to neutral, but in fact FOMC projections suggest um, that actually there'll have to be a move into restrictive territory to um, actually relieve a little bit of pressure on the labor market over time. Um, as Eric's paper this morning uh, showed, it's almost never happened that uh, the unemployment rate in the United States has risen without a recession. And given we have an unusual situation in which inflation is not running above 2 percent and isn't an issue, um, is it going to be possible to pull this off successfully without being the cause of the next recession? So that complex of issues, I think, faces the Fed in the short run. Longer term, you know, as we talked about this morning, um, if uh, equilibrium level of interest rates is going to be low in the future, um, what to do about the fact that monetary policy in the United States and other countries 
um, will encounter the zero lower bound um, more frequently. Um, I gave some, my, some of my own thoughts this morning, but clearly there are a whole complex of issues around what should be done, and as Eric's paper suggested, what's the process by which that should be decided. The other issue I'd point to is the financial stability issue, and there will be ongoing discussions about what role financial stability considerations should play in monetary policy. And I'd say that's highly unresolved. So let me stop there. Yes, well, I had the misfortune to, to discuss about the, the European Central Bank, which is always more complicated than any other central <laughs> bank. <laughs> You know, as a bank uh, without a single treasury, you know, and things uh, uh, are definitely, you know, much more complicated, both in terms of uh, conduct of monetary policy and in the political economy of the decision-making process. Now, in terms of the pure monetary policy uh, function, uh, I think right now the ECB is an, an automatic pilot. Yesterday, you probably heard the, President Draghi, uh, you know, discussing, uh, you know, the, the current stance. And as you know, oh, you know, they will likely discontinue the asset uh, purchases, maintaining, however, the low for longer communication, so the forward guidance uh, uh, on, on interest rate. So, um, of course, I'm not the president uh, of the ECB. I led the ECB a long time ago, but I think if, uh, you know, as an observer, I would say that given the fact that uh, inflation forecast uh, remains uh, uh, well below the 2%, although they don't have a precise 2% target, but uh, you know, their own forecast uh, gives 1.7% 1 per 1 in the next uh, two or three years. Uh, so there would be room to uh, be perhaps less hawkish on the basis of their own elasticities uh, calculation on what is the effect on inflation of the non-standard policy, maybe there could be the case uh, for uh, prolonging them beyond, beyond uh, uh, this year. Uh, of course, they remain ready to act. So if you see, uh, you know, in the current framework of communication, they are, you know, they are basically signaling that they will move uh, depending uh, on how the data will come, uh, you know, in the, in the next few months. Uh, but they're also signaling that, uh, uh, you know, there is a, the, the economy is in a good place. Uh, the euro area is uh, now, the recovery is broad-based, especially the labor market numbers have been quite good. There is some element, that some signal of uh, wages picking up. However, in my own view, and, uh, you know, I, I spend some time doing short-term forecasting and now casting, uh, I can see also that there are signals of risk, and recently the numbers have not been as encouraging. So I would say that, uh, you know, from the pure, you know, kind of stance, short-term concern, uh, I would have been a little bit more, you know, on the dovish side that they currently are. Now, in terms of the big pictures, long-term worries, uh, the question is, uh, um, is the euro area and the euro framework uh, robust uh, to, uh, to a next crisis? And uh, as you know, uh, the response to the crisis has been very painful, and there has been quite a lot of institutional building in the next few years, which I believe have made, uh, made us more robust, especially for what concerns the banking sector, the banking union, the supervisions, and so on. However, there are still pieces missing. Um, we are very vulnerable to debt crisis in the euro area because countries do not issue their own currencies. So that, uh, you know, the sort of land of last resorts and that, uh, you know, most countries with, uh, have their own central banks have, you know, it's much more complicated in Europe. And there are concerns right now by my own country, Italy, which has a government uh, which has given at least ambiguous signals uh, on how they want to cope with, uh, with the fiscal consolidation. So if there were going to be a crisis uh, in Italy or another you know, kind of signals of uh, sovereign debt crisis, uh, how would the ECB behave? Uh, we have one tool, which is the OMT, so this is conditional lending. It has never been tested. So I think that, uh, uh, you know, the long, 
you know, the medium term concern is whether the, you know, the euro area would be able to, you know, to reform its framework, especially for what concerns backstops and lender last resorts that would make it more robust to the next crisis. Um, so, um, a lot of what you see depends on where you stand, and uh, that's true uh, everywhere. It's true in uh, the area of monetary policy also. So, I come from outside uh, traditional macro um, monetary policy research. I, I'm, I do work in corporate finance, and so for a long time I've focused on this concerns about the link between um, macro policy and, and financial stability. Uh, what worries me there, of course, is that uh, what we used to call the financial cycle is getting more integrated with the more traditional business cycle. They're not uh, running separately. Uh, a point that Ben Bernanke made yesterday, I think, comes to mind, where he said, how much room do we have in monetary policy if even at relatively modest interest rates, we start triggering financial booms. And that's actually a very real question. Uh, are, has the financial sector, in a sense, constrained the room for monetary policy? It's a very important question. I don't know that we know the answer, but it certainly seems that uh, uh, it is something which has impact. We should, we should be uh, considering uh, very, very carefully. So that's one area of, uh, I think, uh, uh, both discussion and, and concern at this point. After 10 years of accommodation, we have had uh, pockets of leverage built across the financial system, across the world. It's not the same places as before. Uh, for example, Germany, which didn't have a housing boom before the financial crisis, now has one. Uh, Canada and Australia, which didn't suffer too much post-crisis, are now experiencing the consequences of very high household debt and, uh, and, and housing problem. Uh, we have in China a great unknown. How are they going to resolve the extreme leveraging that took place uh, post-crisis? And will they be able to, you know, the, this question has been asked for the last 20 years, will they have a soft landing or a hard landing? And the truth is nobody knows. Um, but put on top of that, I think the second aspect, which is the global spillovers of all our actions, we are a much more integrated world, and you know, every which way you look at it, that is true. And the, the reality is we don't have governance structures for this integrated world. We have a governance structure which relied on the benevolence of the United States doing the right thing and being the residual claimant in some sense, both in terms of the costs of effort in rescues, but also in, in putting out for everybody else, and also being uh, uh, the entity that showed the way in terms of how to behave. And of course, one of the big concerns now is that uh, that um, dependence on the US can no longer be taken for granted. Uh, one example, which I think uh, we're not paying enough attention to, is what happened in Turkey now. Uh, I'm not holding a brief for the uh, quality of the Turkish administration, but it would be extremely hard to think of a situation in the past where a reasonable uh, uh, member of various bodies like NATO, for example, when they're down, you kick them uh, by levying more tariffs on them at that point. Uh, and it, it suggests uh, that... Uh, the worries about the financial system and how integrated it is, I mean, after all, there are lots of European banks that have lent and are invested in Turkey, and the consequences are not inconsequential, that uh, relying on the United States as being, uh, the, in a sense, the benevolent hegemon, uh, I, I, I don't know if it's a Marxist term, but it's the term that's often used, uh, is something that we have to start worrying about. Uh, and that's a very big risk in this economy where already we have uh, higher levels of leverage. So I, I don't want to say the world is coming to an end. It's not coming to an end. We'll find ways around this. But there are certainly risks that we have to pay attention to. And uh, they stem partly from the connection between financials, the financial sector and other parts of the economy, 
but also the global spillovers in an environment where, in fact, we don't have strong uh, safety nets or a residual claimant, uh, a role that the U.S. Pay, played very effectively in the 70 years post, post-World War. Yeah, you're doing a lot of nodding. Well, I, I agree with Raghu. I, I mean, I think there is a problem with safety nets in the global economy. We saw after the financial crisis, swap lines were very effective. The dollar is very broadly uh, used as a reserve currency ever. Um, we don't see any tendency for that to diminish. And um, in the crisis, the Fed um, extended swap lines to several large developing Sorry, as, as um, governor of the Reserve Bank of India, but he's been arguing for a long time, um, we need a more organized and reliable framework um, for uh, entities, for countries that rely on dollars when um, there is financial stress to have access to those. Um, you know, even in recent years before our new administration, um, the Fed has not felt it had congressional authorization to play that role. And I agree with Raghu that the shift we're seeing in recent years now with the United States pulling away from its global responsibilities or traditional global role just exacerbates that problem and, and others. Richard, do you want to add to that? So if you have, uh, Howen has a mic, and I think it would be useful for our guests if you just said who you were when you asked your question. Sam? Uh, uh, Sam Fleming from the Financial Times. Uh, could I ref pick up on the financial stability issue, uh, and in particular to Janet Yellen? How do you, in the framework that you've been talking about this morning, effectively, as you say in your paper, is committing to fostering a boom, um, how do you, in that framework, tackle the question of financial stability risks which would emerge under such a boom? Is it primarily a regulatory response? Uh, and, and do you see the current regulatory response as being adequate to the, uh, the kind of pressures that are beginning to build up in the financial sector now? Thanks. So I guess I would say I don't see any necessary or straightforward connection between the business cycle and um, financial stability. Um, you know, th there may on occasion be that kind of connection, and it is true that a low interest rate environment may create some um, incentives for behavior that gives rise to financial stability risks, but I don't see that as a very tight connection. And um, yes, I, th I think it's necessary to have supervision and regulation in place that um, addresses that. I don't s still think it's desirable to use monetary policy as a main means of response, but frankly, I think uh, the framework of tools that we have um, are not really adequate to address emerging financial stability risks, particularly in the United States. We um, have done a lot of positive things to improve um, the resilience of the financial sector at the moment. Um, I think it's a lot safer than it was prior to the crisis, but there um, are a lot of shortcomings in the framework that Dodd-Frank created. We have an absence of macro prudential tools uh, to use to address, for example, um, emerging problems with housing prices. Uh, tools that many countries have. Um, we have a real shortage in fewer emergency lending tools than we had before the crisis, which concern me. And it also concerns me that the regulatory environment, while I don't see a significant deterioration, um, there are some dimensions where I, I do worry about what's happening. And actually, yesterday, Raghu mentioned um, leverage lending and trends we're seeing in leverage lending. And um, it's not obvious to me that the banking regulators have successfully been able to 
address that, and we see some reverses on that front and others. So, um, yeah, I think we should use regulation and supervision, and I worry we don't have adequate tools. Lucretia, do you think the European, uh, the Eurozone is better equipped to deal with financial instability today than it was a decade ago, especially given that the ECB now has some oversight of the systemically important banks? Uh, it's on, okay. Uh, well, on the, on the prudential side, uh, I think the single supervisor has made, uh, we have made progress, and I'm saying that uh, also having now sat in boards uh, of, of a couple of banks for a few years, uh, and I've seen the difference. Uh, the, the European banks are much better capitalized now than they were before the crisis. Uh, of course, uh, you know, this is not, uh, and this is very important because the banks in Europe uh, are, are, are the main, uh, uh, you know, so, so this is a banking base, financial sector. So I am, am positive on that. I think that uh, the, the new supervisor is doing the right things, also encouraging banks on getting re rid of the non-performing loans and uh, on, on the capital side. I think we are still fragile uh, in terms of uh, having resolution mechanism uh, that uh, would deal with uh, banking crisis uh, for cross-border banks. I think that this is the new, new frontier of the regulatory discussion, the discussion. What advice would you give to uh, central bankers, given that you said that you think the financial cycle is getting more integrated with the business cycle? How should they prepare for that? What should they do differently so we don't relive 2008? Well, first, I, I think we uh, have a tendency of talking about the next crisis a little lightly. The next crisis, if it comes in the next five years and has anything near the magnitude of the previous one, is probably going to be something extremely dangerous for the entire free world. It's, it's, not, it's not about yet another crisis. We're talking about uh, a total sort of uh, loss of faith in capitalism, uh, uh, a breakdown in, uh, in, I mean, look what this crisis did to us. <laughs> it's got us uh, uh, whole, whole new movements. Uh, but if we can't even uh, sort of put capitalism back on the road, uh, the next crisis will almost surely spell the end of what we've seen post-war, which has actually served the world very, very well. So we shouldn't talk very lightly about the next crisis. Uh, we absolutely must avoid it. Now, uh, what, what can we do? For sure, I think, go along the route that Janet suggested. Let's make sure we have regulatory and supervisory tools, and we use them uh, in order to avert problems before they become large uh, and, and unmanageable. Once leverage gets to a point, uh, you have no option but to accommodate it because it's too late to say uh, or to put in place macroprudential tools which reverse it because anything you do that stops the spig uh, closes off the spigot of, uh, of fresh lending will, is in a sense, precipitate uh, a, a downturn at that point. So you, you have to be forward-looking and, and slow down that process of leveraging. I, and I agree completely with Janet that the first step is through regulatory uh, and supervisory. Uh, of course, you need to have some ability to influence the non-banking sector, the shadow financial sector, where uh, we have to think far more, far harder, uh, how we do that, because we today we don't have, have, have those tools. I think... Uh, and this, I say, we need to deliberate and think because we, I don't, uh, I, I said this uh, this morning, we don't fully understand the effects of all that we do, uh, but we need to think about the links between monetary policy and the rest. Uh, and if there is such a link, how that affects monetary policy. And um, I, I, I'm, I'm not prepared at this point to say, you know, don't go beyond this point or anything of that sort, but I just think it's imperative that we study it with an open mind and not treat it as something that will constrain the independence of central bankers if we even talk about it, therefore keep it off the table and, uh, and, and, and not talk about it at all. Yeah. Um, Swaha Patanaik, Reuters Breaking Views. May I go back to the point you raised about the unreliability 
of a benevolent hegemon. Um, there have been some suggestions coming out of Europe. Mr. Maas suggested sort of using an alternative SWIFT. Mr. Juncker made an aspirational comment of what the euro should be in his State of the Union speech. What, I mean, these are ranging from the plumbing to very sort of high level things. What do you think would be most useful if you are going to tackle an unreliable benevolent hegemon? For all three of you. Well, uh, uh, hopefully the first step is get back a reliable hegemon. <laughs> uh, but, but moving beyond that, I, I think uh, it is natural in a multipolar world that uh, as we move from a unipolar to multipolar, that we focus on more robust rules-based arrangements across the world. Uh, and, and that is something that I think, uh, you know, the silver lining in some of what is happening is it will precipitate a stronger search for those uh, more reliable, robust arrangements. And I think this is extremely important for another reason, which we, are, again, are not paying enough attention to. The weight of the world um, uh, economy will pass over time to a new set of players. And it is extremely important that the, the structure accommodate both the old set as well as the new set. And, and that really means a much more rule-based uh, approach because uh, it's not clear, unlike the past, where most of the big players were, in a sense, corralled uh, by this hegemon, uh, perhaps through devices like the G7. It's not clear that that will be true going forward. Uh, it's not clear to me the G20 is as wieldy a group and it's not clear to me that there will be one single hegemon going forward. So it seems to me that this is the opportune moment where we look for these new arrangements which accommodate a multipolar world and also set in place adequate rules such that we're not just reliant on benevolence, which may actually disappear at some point. Lucretia, doesn't Brexit uh, cause problems if, if they're certainly not going to make it any easier to coordinate across Europe? Well, uh, <laughs> uh, well, it makes for sure the European Union, uh, uh, you know, less of a, you know, less robust. Uh, but in terms of uh, coordination on uh, monetary policy, I think this is mostly a euro problem. And I think if I should interpret what Juncker said, that nobody could really understand. But uh, uh, I mean, if I. <laughs> kind of try to interpret what he, what he meant uh, is to make uh, the euro area governance more robust uh, and uh, we cannot really aspire of being uh, a world currency if we don't have a safe asset, if we don't have uh, a fiscal bus stop, et cetera, et cetera. So I think implicitly this is what he meant. Okay, so that's part of the story, but of course I'm totally agree with Dragoon that- But that I meant more that uh, Dealing with a banking crisis is hard, always. We saw that cross-border banking crises are particularly difficult. It can't be any easier if, if the UK is pulling away from Europe. Well, of, of course, I mean, that, uh, but I mean, I, I really think that, uh, uh, you know, a lot of this discussion about uh, the financial framework is a euro era, is a EMU discussion. And uh, so I think that Brexit uh, has a very indirect effect on that. Uh, Howard? Yeah. Hi, uh, Howard Stein with Reuters. So uh, I wanted to ask uh, Cheryl on a question about your paper that I think, uh, Raghu, if you could also respond to the implications of this sort of commitment. Sort of first off, do you have a preferred metric that you'd use for the Fed to sort of set its goal? And if so, what's your working estimate of how short we still are uh, from that? And secondly, given the concerns you've expressed as head of the Reserve Bank of India of the, of the spillovers, right, are you comfortable with the Fed now saying we're going to stick rates down here for three years, five years, ten years, you know, quote, unquote, whatever it takes to get back up to a certain level and by definition, divorcing themselves from any of those spillover concerns. Okay. I'm going to try to understand your question to Janet. Oh, so she said that she's got to, you know, it's an output, accumulated output gap, and it's an accumulated inflation gap. Does she how have would you quantify this lower for longer? Yeah, for how to quantify it, and if so, how short are, is the U.S. from that today? I'm sorry, so we're not talking about the current situation. Are we 
Well, we didn't have this type of framework in effect. I mean, in terms of inflation, um, I think Ben, in talking about temporary price level targeting, has indicated that we're something like 4.5% um, short in terms of cumulative uh, shortfall of inflation from 2% since we went to the zero lower bound. Now, if we had had a robust policy along the lines that he would want and I would want uh, in place, you can't assume that we would be dealing with um, a shortfall of that magnitude. But um, under his version of this policy, you would stay at zero for quite a long time. But I, um, you know, I, I think we have to think about this. I wouldn't want to apply this now. This framework isn't in effect. Um, you, the FOMC is projecting a mild overshoot um, of inflation above 2%. I think it's useful that they have emphasized symmetry and that especially after seven years of a substantial shortfall that um, a few years of a mild overshoot is um, not, a, not a tragedy and something that is going to require a super aggressive response. But um, there is a framework in effect the framework is one where you're always shooting for 2% inflation. And I've not heard anyone from the Fed try to slip into, um, in the present situation, the kind of framework that I'm, um, that I'm talking about. So, I, you know, I, I, I think it's hard to quantify in a, adopting a policy like this in the future a very firm set of um, quantitative guidelines. Um, Ben's policy perhaps goes a little bit further in that direction than I'm personally comfortable <coughs> with, but um, enunciating a general set of principles that um, it falls short of a quantitative certain mechanism, but a general set of principles is something I would be comfortable with. Just to be clear, everybody knows what she's talking about. So Ben Bernanke has a proposal, temporary price level targeting, where the Fed would have a 2% inflation target most of the time, but when it hit zero, it would then have announced in advance that it would switch to a price level target, by which it means that bygones would not be bygones, and it would run a period of above target inflation for a while to compensate for the <laughs> lower deflation. Raghu, does lower for longer make you nervous? Actually, uh, not if, if if the Fed takes into account financial stability, because I, I think the financial stability, domestic financial stability and external spillovers uh, are not uncorrelated. They're, they're, they're similar in the sa sense that the same things seem to be triggering them off. Kristen Forbes just put up a graph of the capital flows to, to uh, emerging markets. And she showed that before the crisis, there was an enormous increase, right? Uh, and um, you know, at a time when re interest rates were rising, but we talked about that yesterday, whether it was accommodative or not. But the, the, the point uh, really is, if you're paying attention to risk-taking in the financial system, it takes various forms. It takes, you know, you may be taking risk on housing, you may be taking risk in corporate loans, you may be taking risk on emerging markets. If you're paying attention to that, then, you know, you are sort of taking into account these spillovers, and I don't worry that much. It's uh, under two conditions I worry more. One, where you have much better supervisory and regulatory structures to prevent the domestic risk-taking, but the cross-border risk-taking is not prevented, and then the supervisory structures at the receiving end have the burden of trying to make sure it goes into the right places. And not all countries have the right supervisory regulatory structure uh, on the, um, um, on the um, other end. So <clears throat> that's one concern when, when the U.S. in some sense has already put in place those structures, and then uh, it... Uh, it, it sort of becomes a little more worrisome. I'm trying to remember what I was going to say next, but le, le, let's just leave it. Uh, Neil? Hi, uh, Neil Irwin with the New York Times. Um, you know, a, an episode that looms large in uh, your time at the Fed and 
Reserve Bank of India is this 2015, 2016 episode of dollar strengthening, commodity price drops, uh, the Fed was heading toward tightening and eased off for a while. Um, are there any lessons on this kind of forward-looking questions of how you guys should operate, how central banks should operate from that episode? Anything that you feel like you learned from that 2015, 2016 cycle that, um, that your successors should be learning from? So I just say that in both 2015 and 2016, these international spillovers and the fact that disruption in the rest of the world spills back to the United States through um, financial channels and also through trade channels, um, this was an important lesson. I mean, we knew about these linkages. It's not, um, I mean, in going to our earlier discussion, impacts on exchange rates are a standard part of the Fed's thinking about how monetary policy works. But um, I think the, the concern that expectations of tighter U.S. monetary policy was having quite adverse um, spillovers on the rest of the world that was causing financial market disruption that looked to be spilling back to the United States and to be causing a weakening of the global outlook abroad, especially when there are large dollar-denominated debts in many, um, many foreign countries that um, a strengthening of the dollar um, can really produce significant consequences for foreign countries in the global outlook. Yes, it, it, had a, it made a difference to our monetary policy. Um, both 2015 and 2016, we ended up raising rates exactly once in December of each year. And if you said, what happened that caused that when at the beginning of each year the committee expected a larger number of increases, uh, I think those developments were an important part of the answer. Margot, do you want to? I think uh, uh, the Fed's approach, taking into account what was happening elsewhere, was exactly uh, exactly right. Lucretia, how much does it matter to the ECB right now that the Fed is in a process of tightening? How much does that influence what they do? The official uh, story. I don't want the official that. story. <laughs> I mean, this is, uh, you know, exchange rate. The central bankers are not supposed to talk about the exchange rate and things like that. But, I mean, I think that uh, on the exchange rate uh, side, I mean, that's, uh, that's supposed to be favorable, okay? That, uh, um, you mean the Fed tightens, the dollar rises, the euro sinks, yes. that gives the euro a little bit more oomph? Yes. So I think that, uh, I mean, I think this is a problem more for emerging markets because of that denominated in dollars and that than for the euro. Mm -hmm. But does the European Central Bank uh, then have more freedom to tighten because the currency is weak, or do they, uh, or does it not work that way? I frankly don't think that this is, uh, uh, you know, what how they think about, you know, the the, the setting of monetary policies. Uh, the euro area is a large country. It's a, you know, it's a large economy, so that. Uh, you know, it, it's a different, and uh, uh, you know, we don't have the emerging market uh, issues of uh, debt denominated. De Bob Samuelson. Hi, Bob Samuelson, The Washington Post. Uh, my question is a simple one: Is why has monetary policy become so much more complicated? And as a backdrop to that. In the 1950s, we had very low prices. There was not much inflation. It was kind of a consensus not to have much inflation. I don't recall them talking at the time about the zero lower bound or R squared or R starred. Uh, all these things seem to suggest that in a similar situation today, the policy and all the tools are much more complicated. What happened? Um, I mean, growth was much stronger. Productivity growth was much stronger. Um, we didn't, in that period, have very substantial recessions that ever let, led interest rates to be cut to any place close to zero. Um, and 
we've had a very different situation more recently in the aftermath of Japan and then the financial crisis. Thank you. Chris Condon from Bloomberg. Um, question for all of you, but first, Dr. Yellen, is your successor has made a lot about de-emphasizing these unobserved variables. Uh, now, to be fair, you also addressed the idea of the uncertainty in these things, the error bands around those, but he has clearly gone one or two steps beyond that. I'm wondering if there's a risk in there. I mean, there's an appeal to that, but is there also a risk in going too far in that those things also grant us a certain predictability in terms of how policymakers are going to react to a changing economy if you understand their benchmarks that they're going to use? Well, I guess I found it very helpful to talk about those starred variables as benchmarks. Um, and in particular, our star, the notion that if monetary policy, if interest rates are way below neutral levels, that we could talk about policy being accommodative, neutral, restrictive. I thought this is an important device for communicating about the stance of monetary policy. And similar, the U star, um, it is, it plays an important role in. Can you define U star? The no normal natural rate of unemployment consistent with stable inflation. That when the labor market is getting tighter than that, um, we do need to worry about some gradual upward pressure on inflation. So I think um, talking about those levels and their significance is helpful to people to understand what the Fed is looking at with respect to the outlook and the concerns. At the same time, it is very clear, as my successor has said, and I tried to say this too, the level of these stored variables really is uncertain. And, um, you know, it's a hard thing to do as a policymaker to both have a view, but at the same time to recognize your view may be wrong. I think that's what sensible policy needs to do. During the time that I was chair and Ben was chair, if you look at estimates of all of those starred variables, they moved a huge amount. So um, our minds were open. Um, we saw, for example, that our star was moving down a lot, or at least the evidence suggested it was. Similarly, for the normal natural rate of unemployment, and that made a difference. We talked about it. So I, I do think it's it's both useful to have a view. I wouldn't want to go too far. You, you know, without some view, you can't have a forecast at all. And I, I think that monetary policy does have to be forward-looking. So, I mean, at a time like this, I would be worried that the economy is in a situation where it could overheat. Now, I don't think it would be very rapid, but I think it could occur. And my thinking would be based on the fact that the unemployment is, rate is below estimates of U star. But at the same time, I'd want to try to communicate. I'm not confident about that. I am looking at inflation. If inflation doesn't pick up at all, we give it some time. We don't see any pickup in wager price inflation. Um, you know, it's, it, we may be quite wrong about U star. So it is a very difficult thing to both have a view, but also be recognize your view may be wrong and you need to be rethinking that constantly on the basis of what you're seeing. I think that's what he's trying to communicate and I recognize that's especially difficult for the public to understand but I mean it's where I was coming from as well. Yeah, I just wanted to add something that based on my experience at the ECB. In the early stage, the ECB was very much against uh, any star concept. So actually, even the output gap was not in the framework. So when, in fact, I arrived as the director of research, I remember this discussion that, uh, you know, it was very difficult for somebody, you know, an economist coming in not to be able to talk about their, their output gap. And uh, so and instead, we had these ideas of a cross-check between monetary analysis and economic analysis, which was uh, extremely untransparent, okay, even for our own, uh, you know, even for our own staff. And actually, over time, the ECB has moved to a, 
to, a, to some star concept, okay? So now they talk explicitly about the output gap. And I think this has been in the direction of transparency, actually, even if, uh, of course, one has to recognize that there is a lot of uncertainty around these measures. But uh, actually, it has been in, a, in the effort of transparency that uh, we have, and that the ECB has reintroduced some concept like the natural rate and, uh, and the output gap. Any thoughts? Uh, it's, uh, if it's difficult in the U.S., it's much more, or, or in the East, uh, Euro area, it's much more difficult in an emerging market where you're growing, the institutions are changing, um, you have no idea what unemployment is. I, I'm talking about the level of unemployment. You don't know because there's no statistics on that, let alone whether it's changed last month. So uh, you're operating in a, in a, in a fairly um, opaque environment. But uh, uh, essentially, you have to have some models in your mind of how the economy works. Uh, you have some idea of where you think it is. But there's a lot of intuition which goes into, into how you actually manage the rate setting process. And uh, as uh, uh, both Janet and Lucretia said, you look, look at the data as it comes in. And does it suggest that you're mistaken about where you are? Uh, and then uh, rethink um, uh, what the model is and what the parameters are. So it, it's a dynamic process, but uh, I doubt any central banker sort of is a slave to the model. Uh, if you are, then you're not needed. Uh, so you really use the models as a basis for discussion, for communications, very good uh, uh, for, uh, for trying to communicate, but ultimately uh, the rate is set based on a whole variety of other, uh, other things in addition to the model. Professor Rajan, you said earlier today that uh, you, you observed that a lot of the basic questions uh, of were rates too low before the crisis, does QE work, are unresolved, and we continue to hear papers on both sides. And you said what we need is more research. And I was struck by that because I feel like I've heard a lot of research on those subjects in recent years, and it hasn't really progressed the discussion very much. There's a very limited pile of evidence, and people continue to pick over it. I'm curious if you could describe what it is that you think researchers ought to be doing that they're not doing, uh, and if uncertainty is just going to be the fate of policymakers, how they ought to proceed in the face of it. <laughs> That's a difficult question. You were asking me about the sociology of, uh, of research. How do we eventually get to... Uh, an accepted sort of uh, wisdom which we then pass on to future generations. Uh, it's, it's unclear. I, I think it's, it's early days yet, so I wouldn't be pessimistic about us finding answers. Uh, I think, as, as you saw today, the initial wave of, uh, of research, for example, on the effects of QE focused on event study research. And then it moved into trying to discern longer term effects, recognizing there's a whole lot of stuff that comes in between. And I think over time, we'll, we'll, we'll get better at doing it. Is uh, all of this, uh, does it give us anything to work with? Well, I mean, I, I, for example, on the, on the uh, QE research, uh, I think uh, the body seems to be persuasive that QE1 worked very well in repairing markets. And uh, that was that was a, a, a strong benefit, and may have filtered into banks, etc., into their lending practices. I think for the other QEs, it certainly seems to be that one effect seems to be that it signals uh, at least uh, what Janet was uh, was uh, going to the duration before which interest rates will be raised. That at least till we end QE, don't expect. Uh, us to raise interest rates. So it, it gives an accompaniment to low for long. Uh, it, it says, here's why uh, you should believe that, because I would certainly not raise interest rates before I, I, I stop QE. Uh, so it seems to me that we learn more as we do more research. Uh, will we ever be satisfied? Probably not, but it's a, it's a process. I think you're too hard on the research, Spinya. I mean, it was... 30 or 40 years after the Great Depression before kind of the, the community came to any kind of consensus on what the Fed had done wrong then. Um, I, I, I think just a, a, a brief advertisement, since you set me up, 
On October 20th, we've commissioned two papers on what's the evidence on unconventional monetary policy in the United States and abroad. They're going to be in the Journal of Economic Perspectives in November, and we're going to have an event uh, in, on October 24th where I think one can sum up the evidence that exists, agreeing that, of course, it's incomplete. But, Janet, I want to ask you about something in that regard. Um, I, uh, I don't know how to do this without making it a leading question, but substantial research was done at the Federal Reserve about Japan in the 2003-04 period. To what extent was that useful when uh, the world fell apart in 2008? It was tremendously useful. I mean, there was a huge research project trying to understand what had happened in Japan and what the lessons were, and that was discussed when no one could ever really envision this as a problem the U.S. would face. And so, for example, the moral, well, one moral that came out of it was you need to repair your banking system really quickly. And then a mistake Japan made was waiting a very long time to really decisively come to grips with that. And then responding very rapidly and aggressively on monetary policy front. And there was a lot of thinking about tools and asset purchases and forward guns. It was immensely useful when the um, problem arose in the United States. That was a base of knowledge that um, really guided thinking. It was tremendously important. I guess this is an open, uh, Nick Timmeros of the Wall Street Journal. I guess this is an open-ended question. Since you're all former policymakers um, and most of the people here are reporters, what could we in the press be doing better? I mean, if you had to critique or what frustrated you the most about what reporters have done in recent years, people covering, you know, your buildings, um, I, this is very open-ended, but what have we gotten right and what have we gotten wrong? I mean, I'll start off. I, I think I have, not, I have not been very disappointed by um, coverage of the Fed, say, during the time that I was chair and after the financial crisis. I actually think um, coverage of monetary policy has improved dramatically. And I mean, I really had no, you know, sometimes there's um, too much coverage of, you know, for example, at full strength, the FOMC has 19 people and maybe there's too much coverage of um, what each and every um, FOMC participant has to say about policy and the outlook, and it generates a sense of there's absolutely no agreement and no center, and that's one reason I think my predecessor decided uh, in the FOMC pushed them to have press conferences to explain there is a central view, there is somebody, the chair, who's going to explain what is the committee's view that governed its decisions, but frankly, I think the reporting has been by and large quite quite good, and you've picked up on um, issues that are important and covered them. In Europe, uh, I must say that the European press uh, has been quite partisan, so with uh, the German press uh, very much critical of the ECB, you know, taking uh, so I, I think it's quite politically colored, the, the, the way in which the press has commented the, the ECB. And uh, from the international press, I think that it has been, maybe there has been a delay in understanding how complicated uh, Europe was, given uh, you know, the very unusual framework that we have. I think that now you know, the press has, has, has caught up, and I think the, the reporting is better. So, but if I have a complaint, it's about my the European coverage more than the international coverage. Well, I have a different experience uh, with the press in India. I mean, I, I, I think they, they're trying to do the best job they can. Uh, monetary policy is relatively boring, so there's a tendency to, to build it into stories, and often the, there aren't any stories. It's uh, what you see is what you get. Uh, so, so in that sense, the, in India, the tussle is always oh, this is the Reserve Bank against the government, uh, and, and you know, you invoke personalities and so on. Um, well, but that's just the nature of trying to uh, 
sort of understand frameworks and how they work. But uh, I think, by and large, they're they're fair and responsible. Is this related to their casting you as the sexiest central banker in the world? Yeah, yeah <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm now Aoyama from the Asahi Shimbun Japan's newspaper. Uh, I know my question is a little bit out of focus in, in, in terms of today's main agenda, but I, I was wondering if you, each, of, each of you could uh, comment on the tide of populism uh, fed by uh, the economic stagnation after the crisis. I, I mean, at the core of the monetary policy lies uh, the communication uh, with the public, uh, but I, I think uh, the populism, the rise of populism has uh, made it harder uh, for policymakers uh, uh, to focus on their uh, uh, long-term real uh, problems by looking for simplistic solutions. So. Raghav, can you start? And um, because I know you've been thinking about this, but I wonder if in answering the question you could talk about how much do you think monetary policy has to do with this and how much is it all the other things that are going on? Well, uh, I think some of the um, anger uh, post-crisis has to do broadly with the uh, establishment institutions uh, manned by the elite. And to that extent, I think central bankers are pretty much in the uh, targets of the populace, because after all, uh, we're the quintessential elite, uh, guys with PhDs talking a language that nobody understands except themselves, and not talking uh, uh, to the public. But it's augmented by the sense that somehow, uh, and this is a point that Ben was, uh, was, uh, was making yesterday, somehow the rescues weren't targeted at Main Street but was t were targeted at the friends of the uh, of the central bankers, who, namely the bankers. I think Ben was very uh, clear in pointing out that the main objective of the rescue was to actually beneficial to Main Street because it prevented the collapse of the financial system. But this is an argument we have not made as effectively. But I think as important in this has been the. Uh, uh, something which is not the purview of central banks, but uh, justice departments, etc. Uh, why were no important uh, bankers sort of brought to task? And it may well be the answer is none of them really committed criminal acts. It was the system which took on enormous amounts of risk, and we need to tackle that, but not look for uh, putting people in jail for 20, 25 years. But nevertheless, there's a sense that for a downturn of such enormous magnitude, somebody should pay. And who's paid amongst the elite? It's we guys who've lost our jobs. So all that, I think, is part of this populist wave. But but I, I would uh, hesitate to say that's the only sort of factor. There have been factors that have been building up for the last 25 years, some of which even led to the crisis. So, so mention some of those, though. I mean, what was... what was, you, you? I thought your view was that this populist wave has its was planted well before 2008. Absolutely. No, so that is that is my, my view, that there are lots of elements going into that. And I think if you look around, you can see many of those elements already, right? The, uh, the rising inequality in incomes, I think Janet's spoken a little bit about that. Uh, the uh, access to various uh, uh, sort of... Uh, uh, ways of building up capabilities, especially in, in some of the more remote r rural areas. I, I, I think essentially there's, there's a frustration uh, with what is demanded by the modern economy and what is, what is available to, the, to many of these people. Uh, some of it uh, uh, very real, some of it perceived. Nevertheless, that has is, that is, uh, created a lot of anger. Lucretia? Yeah, I think it would be very surprising if, uh, you know, if people had been silent, uh, you know, and I think, uh, you know, it's not only the crisis, but, uh, you know, the trends and in income distribution uh, of the last 20 years. And um, I think that uh, we, the elites, maybe we have been complacent about, uh, you know, just uh, waking up uh, a bit too late about these things and not uh, seeing, uh, not doing our job, I mean, in terms of uh, regulating the financial sectors or, you know, thinking of policies that, uh, 
It's interesting, however, that in Europe, uh, uh, if, if you take uh, countries like Italy, Greece, which have been hit by, by, the, by the debt crisis, uh, the, the, the target of the populist governments uh, is not the central bank, because the low interest rate policy and the quantitative easing has been seen as a plus uh, and something which uh, you know, is kind of a pro-growth policy, which is supposed to be good for the people, okay, so. Well, I agree with uh, both Raghu's and Lucretia's comments about this, and just um, absolutely people felt the financial crisis and the toll it took was completely unfair. Um, they see, importantly, what central banks did in terms of supporting the financial system is absolutely anti-Main Street and don't see that it was motivated by trying to preserve jobs. But also, I totally agree, this is um, th what's been happening to living standards. The median, um, for the median worker, real wages have essentially been stagnant since the late 1980s, and you've had rising inequality, and people just don't feel they're getting ahead. They blame a lot of it on globalization, on immigration, think um, there's probably, there's more to it than that. Certainly economists would point to skill bias, technological change, maybe the decline of unions. Um, to the extent we've had productivity growth, it, hasn't actually been reflected um, in rising incomes to the same extent, so there may be a link, the share of the pie of GDP that's gone to labor has been declining since roughly 2000. So um, this financial crisis came when there was already a lot of pain, discontent, problems, and it all, it, 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 it just, exacerbated that. Well, thank you all. I want to embargo this till 2.30. And could you please uh, join me in thanking our three guests, Raghu Rajan, Lucretia Reichlin, and Janet Yellen.